I like that she tells us we're recording so I can't be sneaky. Or so other people can't be sneaky. Yeah. Some some espionage being uh, being counteracted via Zoom. So, um, man, how's uh, this is weird recording at night, but, uh, you know, at least I get to see you with a, you know, a drink nearby. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, how's everything going? How you doing? Doing good, man. Been busy trying to squeeze in some some reading where I can. I didn't even pick up my books until uh, it was uh, late Friday afternoon when I picked up my comics from the store. Yeah, I got mine Thursday. Yeah. So yeah, uh, swung by and picked them up Thursday afternoon. So same man. It's been one hectic, busy, killer week. Um, I am glad it's over with. So um, and we get to talk some comics on a Saturday. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's weird because we're throwing things off kilter on this show, but uh, you know what's really cool about this show? Like this particular episode that we're recording. Um, if we track it, this is actually our four year anniversary. Um, right. Yep. This is this is episode 208 of the Southern Fried Geekery podcast. And I am uh, for the fourth year in a row, <laughs> Caleb Alexander McKenzie. Matt Trogdon. Um, and we are glad to be back, man. Again, um, Craig is uh, he's visiting some family on the weekends. That's that's the main time he can get up and take care of them and see them. Uh, as we said before, there's some health issues going on, not with Craig, but with with one of the members of Craig's family. So he is taking really good care and spending some really good quality time with them. And we applaud that and we appreciate that from him because uh, that's what you should do. That, that's, you know, family first in, in all things. Uh, yeah. And so, we, you know, we're sending him a lot of light and love. It's weird, though. You know, he and I like have been on the show the longest, like we're the, you know, from the two that started, it's, it is weird. Like, and I say this again, no, no, no offense that yeah, you love, love having your, it's weird not having him here. Like mm-hmm. his voice, not being a part of it is strange mm-hmm. to me. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's, I've, I've definitely, and the same is true when you're not here, but it's, it's definitely there, there are three spokes to this wheel. And when you have one of them gone, it's, it's noticeable. Yeah. Um, so, but I did speak with him earlier today and he, he's doing great. Um, you know, so he is, he's ready to be back. Uh, he he's going to try to hopefully get on in the next uh, probably not next week, but he wants to come on at least after the first of the year again and kind of get back into it. So, and we hope that can happen. We really do. Sure. sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I did something cool this week that I can't tell. I cannot wait. Cannot wait to tell everybody about um, went and saw okay. a little movie, a little, little movie movie that, that hit the, hit the theaters this week. Um, and it was excellent, but we're going to, we're going to get to that later. Um, so for those of you who are new to the show, uh, Matt and I, uh, and Craig, most of the time are, are, are co-host or is that what you call co-host when you got three of us? Are you still co-host or you try host? What? I don't, I don't know the correct vernacular of that. I think, yeah. Co just means shared. I don't know what co means. I'm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I like how you had that serious, like co means I was like, oh shit, Webster. But then you were like, no, not at all. I don't um, know. Yeah, no, our, 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 our third co-host when he's here, um, we all are fellas, you know, live around central Arkansas who love comics. Uh, we grew up on them. It's our favorite pastime. It's what kind of brought us together as friends. Uh, you know, we have other lives, as you might imagine. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying a great break from law school, but uh, we have lives that we lead outside of this. And we're all professionals, but we just enjoy talking about uh, the medium of comics, be that, you know, big two superhero uh, powered stuff or just, you know, crime story, simple storytelling, um, Tom Gold comics, what have you. Uh, maybe this is your first episode. We want to thank you for tuning in um, and just to give you a little idea of what to, to expect. Um, like most shows, this is going to be kind of just a regular format show. We, we were going to try to do a big kind of grand to do thing, uh, for our fourth anniversary, but without Craig, it just wouldn't be right. So we're postponing that. Um, but we're going to start off by telling you a little bit about what we've read. We're going to drop a short stack on you. Uh, you know, like you go to, you go to the, the IHOP and you order a short stack. They drop three amazing pancakes in front of you. We're going to do that, but with comics, cause you know, we, we're, we like food basically we're. I mean, you can't, you can't hate pancakes, right? Like 
who hates pancakes? Nobody does. Uh, and so you can't hate three comics either. Um, and then we're going to roundtable a book that we both read this week and we have not discussed it. We, we read it in tandem and we're going to kind of get into it and give each other our thoughts. Maybe we'll be on the same page. Maybe we'll both agree with, uh, with one another. Maybe we'll be polar opposites. One of us loved it. One of us disliked it. Um, but we're going to give it a fair shot. Uh, and so we're going to cannot wait to talk about that. And then we're going to tell you about some other stuff that we read this week because, you know, lots of comics to be read. So let's kind of get into it, Matt. Tell me about a couple of comics you read. Drop a short stack on me, bro. So my short stack, um, starting with Berserker number six from Boom Studios. This is the book that uh, Keanu Reeves and Matt Kent. Are oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Writers. Yeah. And uh, of course, it's illustrated by Ron Garney, colored by Bill Crabtree. Matt, <clears throat> the... The story here, of course, we did a roundtable on number one of this mm -hmm. book, is this timeless, uh, immortal warrior that just finds different ways throughout the ages to satisfy his violent impulses. Yeah. And, you know, he's more or less in current day and being taken advantage of by the uh, U.S. government. He knows that, but it's like really the only outlet he's been able to find to suit him, but he's really showing um, that he's getting a little sick of that. Right. The artwork in this book is the standout. Ron Garney's artwork in this mm. is so good. I mean, I think this is one of the, this is the best thing I've seen him do in a long time. And I like a lot of the other stuff, you know, the, the last thing I did, I read of his was the juggernaut uh, mini series. That's right. Yeah. Yep. I really liked that, but he's just, I don't know if it's just his style, if it's the story, but it's great. I love his artwork in this book. I really feel like it, it, it really puts the story over the top. Um, number two on my short stack is X-Force number 26. Of course, this is from Marvel. Uh, per the norm, it's written by Benjamin Percy. And the artist is Robert Gill and the colors are Guru Effects. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a really funny moment in this. It's another, these are, these Kid Omega Wolverine moments are always worth the price of admission. Yeah. There's another one in here where Wolverine tries to do his best to give Kid Omega romantic advice. <laughs> uh, while Kid Omega is mourning the loss of his relationship with one of the cuckoos. And um, he basically, he tells... Kid Omega, well, you know, I don't know much about romance, but I know quite a bit about pain. And, uh, you know, just know that eventually you become a little numb. All right, then. Then, yeah. gives him, then, then Wolverine gives him a thumbs up. That's his romantic <laughs> advice. <laughs> just it was so good. And uh, number three on my short stack is number two from Marvel, Hulk by Donnie mm. Cates, Ryan Otley, and Frank Martin. Uh, also present in this issue was Wolverine. Have you read this one? Kyle? I have not. Uh, I'm still a few, you know, with, with finals from school, I'm still a little bit behind. I'm so catching, that's, up, catching up quickly, though. So That's all I'll say, but I, don't, I won't give away any more. But I, man, I'm just, I'm just a sucker for the Wolverine versus Hulk. Yeah. Uh, storyline wherever they may use it um it's, you it's got to be pretty bad for me not to like it yeah quite honestly and so him showing up in this issue the way he the way he was used in this issue i really appreciated um so yeah i i'm not going to say any more other than i uh i once again highly recommend so i I'm the same way. Like whenever those two show up around each other and there's always that tension for, for guys like us, especially, I think there's a, you know, there's always just a, it keys into nostalgia, uh, you know, cause we know the history of that character. You know, we've, we've read 180, 181, you know, all the way back to, to that original fight with those guys. Um, if I, I'm always curious what it's like to read a, a Hulk Wolverine fight for the first time in one of these stories. So it always makes me a little bit nervous. And again, I have the utmost faith in Donnie Cates. I'm always a little bit nervous with that because you always wonder, it's like, okay, this is somebody's first Wolverine uh, Hulk fight. Like they're the first time that they're, they're going at it for somebody. 
and what what that must feel like to find out oh this was really cool oh man if you liked that fight you need to go check out like all these different issues um because there's a long and storied history there of those two just going at it so yeah oh yeah man yeah. that was the only i think that was the only redeeming quality of that savage hulk miniseries that came out years ago yeah yeah that fight between them and that was amazing yeah amazing it was well for who I forget who the artist was on that, but I remember it being well drawn. Yeah, the art's great, yeah. and I don't recall who it was either. But it's oh man, it's so good. Those that fight between those two and that is just the best. Yeah, I've got all I've got. I think it was a four issue series. I've got all of them upstairs uh, in in bags and boards and stuff. So, um, well, all right. Well, I will jump in and drop my little short stack on it. Uh, and I'm sure you've. I think you've read this. Um, first and foremost. Uh, a few weeks ago, a series that I've really been enjoying has wrapped up. It was six issues, and that's Batman Detective. Um, Batman the Detective. Yep. Now, this was, um, like I said, it's a little out of continuity miniseries. Um, it was written by Tom Taylor. Andy Kubert uh, did an amazing job on the pencil. Some some really good, uh, you know, kind of standard Kubert. Like it, it's who it's what you expect from him, but still really really good. Uh, with Sandra Hope on the inks uh, and Brad Anderson doing the colors with Clem Robbins on the letters. Um, just a really fun series. Uh, you know, yeah. it, it, it's it's always weird for me. I, I won't say weird. Gotham is such a character in Batman in his universe that yeah. I, I'm never sure how I feel about a story that takes him out of Gotham. Uh, in this, he does. He goes, I think they were in London uh, yeah. And he goes overseas to help deal with kind of some shit. And there's like this Batman international team uh, where one of the leaders of that has gone rogue um, and is just doing some stuff that they ought not be doing. And he's got to go take care of it. Um, so when I, when I read a bat story, that's not in Gotham, um, you know, I kind of take two steps back. I side eyed a little bit because I've had some bad experiences with that. Um, but this was, this was great. This was a really fun series overall. Um, I, I, it reminded me so my my favorite story outside of Gotham is Batman Europa from a, a few years ago. Mm. Um, that's a really solid run. And it, it, you know, it didn't give me those vibes, but it's still really well executed. So Tom Taylor uh, continues to just do an outstanding job. Um, then I read from our little buddies over at image comics uh, crossover number 10. Have, are you still reading this series or did you bounce off of it? So this series has gone places I never imagined it would go. It is over the top meta. Um, in this particular issue, Brian Michael Bendis is a main character because there is somebody in this world, uh, just to set it up, this the world that this takes place in is supposed to be our world, except there has been something happened and a breach between worlds has, has rendered uh, an opening from which all of these comic book characters have entered our world. Uh, and they they all got sucked into a dome of some sort, an energy dome over Denver for <laughs> of all places. Which you know, look if 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 Asgard can hang out in Oklahoma, the dome can be in Denver, right? So, yeah. uh, but they they all got sucked into there. But somebody has been going around killing comic book writers uh, because they 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 associate them with what's been happening. These these superheroes and these characters mm -hmm. from comics who are in the dome. In this particular book, both Brian Bendis and Michael Avon Oming are being interrogated by their characters from the Power series, <laughs> and it, it is it is fantastic. Um, and and like I said, completely meta, completely over the top. And I feel like it's this came out three weeks ago because I think there's already been another issue that has came out. But in case it's not, you know, spoilers. But um, Donny Cates himself uh, himself shows up in this series uh, as being. A very tr a very troubled young man <laughs> who is causing some problems. Um, I, I love it, dude. The 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 crap that goes in that book, you, you know, the meta storytelling, the you know, put it putting the mirror as close to uh, the reader as possible and bl blurring the the lines between you know the character and the story is really cool. Doing a great yeah, yeah. job with that. Uh, and again, to see Brian Michael Bendis and and the dialogue sounded like Brian Michael Bendis and, and being interrogated by his by his own creations was uh, was good stuff. And then last but not least, uh, chapter five of Cullen Bunn and Jonas Scharf and Alex Gimerez's Basilisk from Boom Studios. I really enjoy the conceit of this story. Uh, there are uh, these 
monolithic figures uh, whose that you know it's it's each of the five senses uh, made into a really powerful metaphor that are that can ultimately destroy the world if they choose to uh except one of them has gone rogue and it's actually the the person who embodies the sense of sight uh, I'm, I'm showing you the cover for the people who can't see but uh it's it's a lot of fun and it's it's very much a fugitive story um jonas sharf and alex gimerez can do no wrong together i really enjoy seeing those two people uh the work that they produce is spectacular so uh, they're on the run again. Um, you could just get to see just how truly broken these kind of gods are. Uh, and, and that's kind of a cool conceit. So um, yeah, if you haven't been reading that, pick it up and trade if you can. Uh, I think it's got one more issue. I think it's going to be a six issue series. Could be wrong on that, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm always down for a good Colin Bunn story. Uh, he, he is a very prolific writer uh, and nine times out of 10, I'm really, really going to enjoy uh, what he puts down on the page. So, uh, you know, and, and just a nice dude to boot, like anytime where, you, you know, with these creators that we've had some sort of personal interaction with them uh, and, and they're just decent human beings that, that tends to lead me down the, uh, the path of liking them more or like yeah. liking their product more because uh, yeah. it just personalizes them. So, yep. um, that's that's my short stack. So in in reading those, uh, good stuff all around. Um, I really get, I've got to, I've got I'm you know what I'm going to read Hulk after this after we're done. I should have read it before, but I, I will go get that read and then I'll text you about it and then we'll share really deep and important thoughts and our listeners can just be uh, you know they can be in awe of what they're missing out of. So um, before we before we dive into our book de la week or our round table if you will i gotta give a spoiler warning as we always do um we are going to talk about a book that came out this past week it, it's only been out for a short couple of days now so it might be sitting in your pull list or it might be on your your list of things you're going to download and we don't want to ruin that experience for anybody we you know i hate when that happens so uh you know we try to give people a nice little heads up so if you have not read in this case wolverine wastelanders or wastelanders wolverine i'm actually sure not not sure which moniker comes first um, then hit the pause button, go, go check it out or, or uh, you know, skip ahead a little bit till we're done talking about it uh, and then come back and revisit it because we, yeah, just don't want to, don't want to ruin your reading experience. Cause that would kind of suck. Um, so, cause we're going to talk about it. It's, it's worth talking about. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, wastelanders Wolverine. I think wastelanders is actually the thing that comes first. Cause I think there's a whole series of these that focus on different characters. Uh, this is written by Stephen S. DeKnight uh, with Ibrahim Mustafa uh, as the artist on it. Colors by Nira J. Minton and VCs Corey Pettit uh, did the letters. And I got to shout out um, Jose Maria Casanovas uh, for doing uh, the cover art on it, which was you know really really well done, really execute well executed. Um, and I got to say, you, you know, cover the the cover did a really good job of homaging Steve McNiven. Um, and I was, I was really pleasantly happy to see that, uh, him get that nod from these creators. So just, you know, kind of the 30,000 foot view, this is, uh, if you, if you haven't read old man, Logan, you might not, you, this, this might not be the best place to start with that. Kind of <laughs> That's correct. Yeah. So, so, you know, go, go do yourself a favor and read old man, Logan, uh, before you read this, but come back and read this. Um, that'll at least give you the context to which this story takes place so um just in saying that matt what's your kind of thirty thousand foot take on this i like the book um i didn't realize this was a one shot yeah i thought this was a, this was a start of a new series um about wolverine so yeah i got to the end of the the last page i'm like oh okay i was a little confused yeah so i well now number one now you know how i felt last week uh, <laughs> so, um, in, enjoy that feeling. Number two, um, kind of same. Uh, I really, I really thought they did the, the book was well executed. Um, it, uh, no, no major complaints. I, I did find myself reading this and by, by no fault of the creators, um, reminiscing and feeling a little bit nostalgic for old man Logan, uh, for the things that came before that. And that this is, um, that this is based on and just kind of wishing that, you know, 
it was them. And again, that's not fair to the creators because this book is fine, but yeah, it definitely put me in a headspace. I was like, man, really, really could, could go back to these old older books and just read those. Uh, and that's the only, only issue I had is it, uh, it got me feeling a little bit nostalgic, um, which could be just the headspace I'm in this week uh, for, for a multitude of reasons. But uh, so, you know, it was kind of me wanting to go pull out the other books upstairs. Um so, but I mean, that's, that's not, that's, that's nothing against the book. I thought it was great. The art was, the art was, you know, it, it was serviceable. It looked fantastic. It wasn't anything that I would really, you know, it's not going to be on my artist of the year list. Uh, you know, it, I don't know how you felt about it, but I thought it was, I thought it was fine. I thought it was really good. Yeah. It was a, it was an interesting read. And yeah. um, so I, I knew it was a one shot just to p- keep piggybacking off of, uh, off of yours because I had, I, I had see, saw an advert advertisement for a uh wastelanders hawkeye podcast that that is coming uh, and you actually see there's there's going to be another one shot i think for that but you get a wastelanders uh hawkeye podcast that is going to be coming out or is already out um on the book and i find that interesting uh, i think it's it, you know podcasting it, the, the, i mean essentially they're they're revisiting radio right the the old radio stories made you know made famous by you know first of all superman uh so it's really cool that they are linking comics and and pod the world of podcasting and they've done this before i know there was a wolverine um based podcast i think you listened to didn't you yeah benjamin that was uh if i, were, if I remember correctly that was benjamin percy's first wolverine story yeah and that podcast did so well you know, it led him into the Wolverines, writing the Wolverine series. Nice. Uh, and it was, the podcast was surprisingly good. I, you know, I thought, well, I was, you know, eh, I'll see how this goes. Yeah. It, it was really good. I found myself really enjoying it and um, uh, wanting to like read the comic. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so I need to go back and listen to that because I have not done so yet. It's it's weird. I don't, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I don't listen to a lot of narrative podcasts. See, I don't either. I listen to, zero narrative yeah. podcast and you know i've tried listening to some but frankly the the quote acting that's done mm-hmm. in it is usually just unbearable right yeah it's, it's yeah get. no yeah absolutely you know. um but but yeah that one that one i, I enjoyed i'll go check them out because like, like you know i'm always down to hear you know I, anything that puts stories into more places i i support yeah, to some extent. So if you can get more people um, listening to these stories uh, via podcast, that's great. I will say with the caveat that so much, at least to me, so much of the importance of of these characters and the history of them comes in the visual uh, that is yeah. as part and parcel of the medium. So yeah. there's some there's going to be something missing there. Uh, you know, a friend of mine has read a bunch of the novel, the Marvel uh, novel adaptations of different things. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's great. That's awesome. And they, they love it. And I'm like, but you're missing, you're missing so much by not seeing that, that art. It, it really, these stories were made for a visual medium uh, yeah. and, and you miss out on all of that. But again, no, no, not towards that. I'm, I kind of am curious to see what they're going to do with, uh, with this podcast and the continuance of putting out some narrative stories in podcast. Uh, form and and the cool thing is is it looks to at least you know uh, at least to this like they're going to accompany comics um and and that i'm down for so um so let's get into talk a little bit about what the actual plot of the uh of this book was um so the thing i like the thing i love the most about uh old man logan stories uh is that they are all based out of it, it's all founded on like a western conceit and i love westerns like i i adore them i grew up grew up watching western films and this uh this story is no no different uh it starts off it shows you old man logan uh riding a horse through the desert and he's on the run he's being chased by something doesn't it doesn't really say what but if you've read the you know if you've read the other stories if you have the history and the context you know that he's being chased by the hulk gang uh these are grandchildren of you know inbred mutilated uh gamma irradiated festering shitbags of people uh quote i'm using air quotes for people 
uh, that are that are de- derived from the Hulk, and they have laid waste to the to this entire wasteland. And, and you know, you can go back in the history they they destroyed Logan's family. They you know they they wrecked his life, um, and it all it all bases from the the history uh, of Mysterio using his powers to trick Wolverine into killing all of his friends and family, all the X Men, um, and and that's you know after that happened, he you know he did the whole you know, hang up his hat and, and set aside his guns thing, uh, you know, promise never to use his claws and never kill anybody again um, until the, until the Hulks came and, you know, wrecked the new family that he found and destroyed everything. Um, and they broke him, uh, you know, not, not physically, but I mean, at some point they broke him physically, he got his ass kicked, uh, but they broke him mentally as well. Uh, and so, you know, over the years, he had to, you know, he, he brought the claws back out. They, he had, he'd let himself be vulnerable. He'd let himself fall in love. Um, and they took that away from him. And, you know, with a man like Wolverine, whenever, you know, he has nothing left to lose, that's when he's at his most dangerous. Uh, and, and he was, he wreaked havoc on the Hulk clan. Um, so, which gets us to where we kind of are now. If you read the last, uh, the last old man Logan series, he actually is, <laughs> unwillingly the guardian of a small toddler uh, hulk <laughs> so again this is another one of the grandchildren of bruce banner that he's taken care of um that is that is his ward and this is a little bitty baby i mean so so old man logan one of the most dangerous people left in this wasteland of universe is is being a nanny to this squalling um teeny tiny muscular green ball of gamma uh, anger, um, who is hungry and is crying. Uh, so as they're wandering through the wasteland, uh, you know, they, they, they stop to take a break. Uh, you know, they're going to camp out and spend the night. They're beset upon by a group of, uh, you know, ghost, ri- they're called the ghost riders, but they're not spirits of vengeance. They're just a couple of bikers that have a gang out in the woods and they paint skulls on their face. Um, and he just, wait, say, say, say it again. They're wannabes. Yeah, they are. They are one thousand percent wannabes. Um, yeah, it just uh, people like this shouldn't ride motorcycles. As as a former biker, I'm I'm offended for all for, for Ghost Rider himself. Um, but you know, he he dispatches them pretty quick. There's a very comical moment where he looks over, um, and like you know, toddler Hulk is <laughs> chewing on one of these poor bastards' arms because uh, he's hungry, and he, Wolverine has to go like snatch it out, which which makes that poor child very unhappy. Uh, you know, the next day they, they, they continue to just wander into the wilderness. Uh, one thinks, or one at least would think that, that Wolverine knows where he's headed um, because they come upon a kind of an abandoned Western, it's not a ghost town, but it's someplace he thinks that he can get supplies and, and stock up. Uh, unfortunately for him and our little green baby, uh, the town has been wrecked. Like somebody's came down and just demolished everything um i guess knowing uh, like like this is somebody heading him off um and about the time that he figures that out he starts to smell something uh and realize something's wrong this giant machine uh very iron man ish looking design comes crashing through a wall um and you know at the like you know th- th- logan is on edge always right like he is he's always expecting the unexpected and so he is he's not surprised even though this person kind of has the jump on him and so he's just like oh man you 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 know you you picked the wrong fight this this was not the day um and just lunges at him you know claws out ready to just take this dude apart except uh here's the problem his claws bounce off this iron machine uh this this giant metal machine because it's not made of iron it's actually an adamantium iron man suit uh, that is being piloted by the irradiated, decapitated, but undying head of one Bruce Banner himself. Uh, and you know the, the 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 what's what's the Willem Dafoe line from uh, Boondock Saints? It, it was a firefight. That it, it was it, it was a firefight. Those these two guys go after each other and. You know, this is like any other Western. The White Hats win. Uh, eventually, Logan finds a way to overcome. But you're going to need to go spend a little bit of money to pick up this book to see to see how he manages to overcome um, seemingly uh, impossible odds as as Logan is wont to do. So, um, 
that that's your story. That's this one shot. It's a really good Western. It really is. It is, it, it is a fun story. The conceit, I'm, I'm down with it. I, it, it is comical when it needs to be comical, but you still remember how much of a threat and how dangerous uh, Logan is. Uh, so I, I, I enjoyed it. I had a fun time with it. Yeah. I mean, I did too. I, you know, I didn't think about what you said earlier that this could possibly be somebody's first exposure to this, you know, old man Logan story setting. Mm-hmm. Um, if you went into this without that background, man, I, I would think you're going to be awful confused. <laughs> yeah, well, well you, you, du- doubly so because not only are you getting the, um, you, you know, if, if this is your, if this is your first foray into a meetup, a clash between Hulk and Logan. And if this is your first foray into old man, Logan, then you've got to be doubly confused reading this. Cause uh, there's, yeah, you know, there, there's only a small blurb that really sets the mood in that. And, you know, um, every comic is somebody's first comic. Uh, yeah. and, and I don't know that this, this should be somebody's first comic. No, because there's just so much, and, and the word derivative comes to mind. But again, that word's got such bad connotations. Yeah. Um, you know, when I use the word derivative, it's usually uh, disparagingly, and I don't mean that to use here. But this this book is derived from so many other things that came before it uh, that you really need to have in your uh, contextual suitcase to really fully appreciate the story. I think. Yeah. Oh, yes. This this especially something as bizarre as this whole world and this setting. Yeah. <clears throat> this setting is, <clears throat> it's just, yeah, it's not going to make any real, it's not gonna make any sense to you if you have not read the old man Logan stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, it's just going to be none. It, yeah. It's way, that's what that storyline is way too unique from everything else. So you really need to have read that for this to make any sense whatsoever. Well, and I would imagine the same is going to be true for the old man or for the um, for the Hawkeye one shot that comes up next, because we're going to get the Wasteland yeah. Hawkeye score. And I haven't read the old man Hawkeye series. Uh, and so that oh. might be something I've got to go do. Um, yeah, it might. I, I would think as long as you know the old man Logan storyline, I wouldn't think you'd need to read. I, you know, that's just an assumption that I would make. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you know, it's it's going to add more. It, but to your point, it will add more context if you had. Um, but would it be necessary? I think it's necessary to read Old Man Logan to read this comic book and get some any kind of understanding or appreciation. Yeah. I, I, I will say I got to give some credit and a shout out to Ibrahim Mustafa. Uh, Mustafa. Uh, there, there, he did something really cool with this. Uh, when when. When Logan first pries the the faceplate and the helmet off of the off of the Iron Man suit, and this is this is a Hulkbuster for for like folks who, uh, you know, if you're trying if you haven't seen this and you're trying to envision it, he draws this giant suit like a Hulkbuster suit. So this is the inside is made to contain something very large, which makes it all the more comical when you realize it's just this teeny tiny head inside that's been plugged in and is running this off of <laughs> gamma radiation. But he does something really cool. When, when Wolverine first pries the, the helmet off, it's Bruce Banner's head. And it's like small in the space of the helmet. Like the, it, it takes up less than a quarter and it's got all of these different tubes that are coming down and, and feeding into his brain and stuff. But he gets mad <laughs> and he gets green and like his 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 head starts growing. Yeah. <laughs> and it does this Modoc thing, like his, his glasses break. But in the next scene, it, it like there there is no room in this helmet. Yeah. It, just this head has grown so much that it's spilling out of this helmet. And I thought that was a really good, like a really good understanding of scope and space. Uh yeah. that that a you know a lesser artist would not have really taken the time to appreciate. Uh, and to really flesh out on the page. I thought that was a really great moment in yeah. this book. Um, and, and you know, it, he's not Steve McNiven, but he does give a really good visual nod to Steve McNiven, when he, especially when you see Old Man Logan's face. I, I, he does kind of draw Old Man Logan's nose as being too bulbous to me, which is a, a strange nitpick, but, <laughs> you know, um, if, if that's all the negative things I have to say, then then I was treated well by this book. Yeah, I would think so. Yeah, um, I really got a kick out of out of Baby Hulk, <laughs> Scream, just screaming "Daddy" into the yeah. into the ether. That was fun stuff. 
Um, so yeah, no, I, I encourage people to go, go check this out. Like you said, it is a one shot, but it is going to, um, tie into this Wastelanders series. Uh, and you know, I, I would assume tangibly connect to that podcast that we, we discussed. Um, so it, it's a good time. It's a good time. I'm not usually a big fan of like weird little one shots that, that are like so wholly connected to something else that came before, because it's very easy to, um, to get lost in the minutia of those yeah. things. But this was very well balanced and well executed, uh, both visually and, and in the plot. Yeah. So, uh, and man, I, that's, that's really all I can say about it. That's, that's me um, tapped out on this book. It was, it was fun times. I encourage folks to go pick it up. Yeah. There's not a whole lot to, there's not a whole lot to um, dig into or take a part in a story like this. It's just a, a one-off set in this world picks up where, you know, the last issue of the old man Logan thing left off, mm-hmm. you know, so there's not, a, there's not a whole lot to interpret there. I got I got a big kick out of the fi- final like the final fuck you <laughs> that Logan gave to Hulk. Um, yeah, the, the, those last moments <laughs> before the story ends were uh, they were a lot of fun. Um, yeah, just talk about giving a middle finger to somebody. So. Yeah, um, go check that out. We'll have to. Uh, I'll, I'm I'm gonna have to keep my eye out for Hulk and uh, for <laughs> Wastelanders Hawkeye um, and and loop in and see how that that treats us and. Uh, We'll, we'll come back and let you know on that. And if anybody other than us, you know, does listen to the, the Hawkeye podcast, um, come, come tell us about it. Come, you know, e- either send us an email, which you can do at Southern, you know, Southern fried geekery at gmail.com. Uh, you can come hang out with us at our Facebook page. Where you just type our, our moniker into the search bar. It'll bring you right to us. Uh, or you can post in our comments, which would be a little awkward, on Instagram or, or tweet at us at, at SFG podcast uh, on both of those platforms. But uh, really the thing I would like to encourage folks to do is if you do listen to this is to come to our Facebook group uh, and, and talk about it and open up and we'll, we'll chat with you about it. Cause I'm curious to see how, how those things that, that, that platform, that, that medium uh, translates to this kind of storytelling and how fans fans see that other than Matt, cause Matt's told us and, and <laughs> Matt, you know, hashtag Matt was right. <laughs> yeah. so, um well man i'm curious what did you read this week tell me about something that that you enjoyed so i picked up something at random i just came across at the comic book store at kapow comics in sherwood that i'd heard of but i other than the title i didn't know anything about uh they had the trade paperback of uh from dc's vertigo line uh from brian azarello and Marcello Frusen, Loveless. Oh, yeah, okay. Have you read this? I haven't, but I've heard about it. Yeah, it's called Loveless. The subtitle is A Kin of Homecoming. Uh, this originally was a five-issue series. Um, came out in 2005. And so I'll read the synopsis on the back. Wes Cutter is a wanted man running from a violent past. The horrors of the Civil War a brutal stint in a union prison camp and the savage fallout of reconstruction. But now he's come home to a town full of deadly secrets in search of his wife, Ruth, a tormented woman who hides dark secrets of her own. Don't all tormented women hide dark secrets? Uh, um, I don't know about all of them, but I've known a few that do. (laughs) (laughs) So... This is a old west story. Mm-hmm. It's a very it's set in realism. It's not supernatural. It's not super powered. It's just a you know, man comes home from the civil war and he's not happy with what he's coming home to for several reasons. What was interesting about this book is this main character, Wes Cutter, he's a um, Confederate soldier. Mm -hmm. And he goes off originally to fight the war because he feels like he has to because if he doesn't support the war effort, what's going to happen to 
him and his family, what's the community going to, how's the community going to tr treat him and his family if he doesn't support the war effort? Right. And also, he's afraid that if the union wins, they'll lose their livelihood. They'll, you know, they, that, you know, it's unknown what the union would actually do now that they're actually at war. Would they treat the Southern states as traitors? Mm -hmm. So he feels like he has to go to war, not because he is pro-slavery. Uh, he doesn't definitely, does, he's just an average guy. He doesn't yeah. own slaves. He has no stake in the slavery game. In fact, he, he says, you know, I never really thought it was right to try to own another human being. Well, you know, he comes home after the war and his land has been seized. And he is rightfully hacked off about that. But he blames the South for secession uh, as much as he blames the North for taking his land. Yeah. So he's, he's mad at everybody. Right. He's not coming home a, a diehard Confederate soldier loyal to his, you know, to his um, culture. He's pissed that the whole war happened and that he had to go do this and he lost everything and gained nothing. Yeah. So, you know, the story is about him making these, he's not coming into town guns a blazing. He's coming into town, making very calculated moves to get into a position of power in this little town. Mm. Meanwhile, there are, other ex-Confederate soldiers who are reacting violently to the South losing the war. It's two years after the war, and there are certain Confederate soldiers that have banded together just to cause chaos and make life hard on the occupying federal or union troops. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're ter yeah, terrorist cells, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, which, you know, that's where the Ku Klux Klan came from, right? or ex-Confederate soldiers that... Uh, we're reacting to the fact that they lost the war. So it was, it's, it's a, this is not a simple crime story. I actually read this three times. Really? Okay. Yeah. Because there's a lot of characters. There's a lot of different motivations for these characters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this main character, Wes Cutter is making very specific calculated moves you know amongst the you know people that he used to have as neighbors yeah people that um, are in charge of this town now the occupying union soldiers the role that they you know there are some soldiers that assaulted his uh, wife when he left um, so there's a, there's a lot going on here, a lot going on here. So I did, I read this three times and then I went back more than that, really digging into certain, <clears throat> excuse me, certain pages to really understand it. Right. So this is the kind of story that's not going to be for everyone because there's so much to it, mm -hmm. but it was an interesting experience, you know, going into it thinking I was going to read, you know, a old Western simple coming into town, straighten out the people he wants to get vengeance on type story. That's not what was going on here. Uh, there's more than that. Well, and I, I feel like that's the kind of story that Azarello really shines when he writes. I mean, you know, and, and you and I are both fans of Azarello. We've read a lot of his catalog. He is very good. You know, hundred bullets is a prime example he, he's very good at juggling a multitude of characters with, like you said, this very depth, uh, very deep, very structured motivations where, where they're not just, it's not just one person has one thing that they're aiming for, for. There is this complex mix of emotions and drives for each of these people. And you're never, never really sure which one is the, the prime motivating factor. Uh, but, you know, and, and like I said, 100 Bullets is a, is a great example of that. His his Joker is kind of that way, too. Um, I think there's less characters in that, but it is a very complex kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, that he's just so good at that, uh, especially mixing crime and um, 
almost a detective style story to it. And I've never read this. I'm going to have to read this. Uh, this is, this has got to go on my list. Yeah. Um, I recommend it. Um, if you like crime stories, if you like you know, old West stories, this mm -hmm. is definitely a Western. There's no doubt about it, but I, I would just, you know, the only caveat I would give is, you know, this is one you're really going to have to digest. Yeah. This is not a, this is not a, what I would consider just a laid back, easy, fun read. Cause there's, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Yeah. Well, and in five issues there, it sounds like there's a lot of context that, that you're gonna have to go in with an open mind to. So we've had this conversation recently about Confederate soldiers that were going into the war that, like you said, had no real opinion on slavery and you know it's it's interesting to be guys from the south like you and i are who who grew up um you know there, there are still a lot of people in the south who would tell you that you know the civil war wasn't quote unquote really about slavery that it was about something else i don't think you and i are those people um i, I you know we'll flat out say no the civil war was about yeah. slavery it was that's about factually yeah. incorrect yeah, that, yeah, you know, the, the south seceded because of slavery yeah, right? every yeah, every single one of the articles of cessation from every single state that seceded mentioned the slavery as the cause like it's it's just the part and parcel of what caused it um you know there are people who come back and you know states rights and yeah states rights to own a human being um, um, yeah. <laughs> that's 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 what what it is but it th there's also the flip side of that which we have spoken about before um actually i think we spoke about it in conjunction to a story that garth ennis wrote um, that involved Nazis, uh, I think is what it was, but, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, at the time of the civil war, your average person throughout the United States, but specifically your average person throughout the South, which is in a very agrarian culture was illiterate. Um, you know, media was not at their disposal. They did not have, um, they, they didn't have the ability to kind of know what's going on. I mean, obviously they didn't have 24 hour news cycles, but, you know, they didn't even have the telephone. They, it was, you know, at, at most they had telegram. And if those, those wires were easily disrupted, you were kind of limited to the spread of information through the trains. Uh, you know, that was the fastest route to get information from point A to point B was through somebody getting on a train and taking it there. So it was very easy for, you know, your upper echelon of Confederates, people who were really pulling the strings um, to spread this, uh, propaganda about northern aggression and uh, about states rights and it being imposed on people um as uh, you know the difference between you know the united states and these united states uh is is really the way it was it was primed and so i think you have to remember that like that's the context you have to go into a story and again i'm just saying this from the historical background of the civil war uh, not having read loveless uh, which I really want to do, but I, I really hope people are able to go into that with that context of knowing that just just because a man fought on the side of Confederates um, did not necessarily make him um, a what we would think of somebody who's flying a Confederate flag today or who is pro Confederacy in modern times. It's taken on a different thing. Um, that person very well, like you said, was was afraid of being labeled a coward. Uh, you know. It, it was it was a crime at the time to not go fight. <laughs> like yeah. they would they would arrest you if you if you didn't sign up. Um, conscript conscription was real. You had to have a very good reason not to go fight yeah. um, for for one side or the other. Uh, and so and people who didn't were you know carried out of town and their families were destitute. They you know they they were considered widows and orphans. Um, so I, I really hope people who read this are able to contextualize that. Um, that's, that's the kind of baggage you got to carry into a story like that, you know, to any story like that. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's interesting. I may have to borrow that from you. Sure. Yeah. Just, just slide it over to you, boy. Just, yeah. can you just give it to me right now? I'll just reach uh, the thing and, and grab it from you. Yeah, um, I want you to take a trip with me. Okay. I want you to jump in the Wayback machine with me. I want to take you back to 1963. Oh. Um, I want to take you back to a time where the characters that we know and love today, uh, especially centered in the Marvel universe, weren't really established. And the people that we idolized and, and we've enshrined weren't celebrities. And I'm talking about people like Steve Ditko, 
um, Stan Lee, and in important to what the story I want to talk about, um, John Romita. They weren't the people that we think of today, right? So I want to talk to you about a little story um, that that came out in August of 1963 called How Green Was My Goblin? (laughs) So this story actually is number 39 of the amazing spider-man 39th issue that ever came out it's particularly particularly sorry south mouth important uh because this is the first spider-man story that i'm aware of not drawn by steve ditko um it's under the amazing spider-man title this was john romita's uh first um foray first 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 issue to a very long tenure uh, a very important tenure on that that book which is which is really cool so and of course it, this I, I'm, I'm telling you this it would be silly to to, to bury the lead i'm telling you this because right now um people are flocking uh, hopefully wearing masks when they're doing so but flocking to the theaters to, to see the new uh the new spider-man movie that came out spider-man no way home uh it's breaking records people are loving it. i've actually seen it uh, i know i know matt you have not seen it yet um i loved this movie now you know there are people that every 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 marvel movie that comes out is the best marvel movie like everyone that they've seen it's new um the winter soldier has been my favorite marvel film for you know since it came out i think it's great yeah this this very well topped that for me uh, i i this wow. this spider-man movie wow. yeah this 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 may be my favorite of the live action mcu movie. wow um it is it is incredibly incredibly good now recency bias is a real thing i want to say that before anybody you know jumps jumps at me um and also uh i'm in a i'm in a place right now uh where sentimentality and nostalgia um is gonna hit me different uh you know for those of you who who are friends with me on facebook uh we had to put down our beloved family dog this past week uh you know my my boston terrier jezebel i've had her for a decade she was a member of the family roger and i both were just wrapped around her little fingers and we had to say goodbye to her so we're in a place right now where sentimentality and nostalgia are really going to affect us differently but all that being said it's just genuinely good like it is insane uh it, it it breaks it is nothing I ever expected to see. It was ambitious and they just pulled it off. So, but none of that, other than the fact that y'all need to go see it because it's great, has anything to do with this story. I mean, some of it does, but yeah, you're going to find out which part for yourself. Um, but let's let's go back to the story I want to tell you about. Amazing Spider-Man number 39. So um, Peter Parker knew it being Spider-Man, knew in college, uh, he's having a rough go on it, hasn't made a lot of friends. It has had had some stuff going on. If you if you read the final issues of Steve Ditko's run, you know that Aunt May having some health problems. Um, you know she she's an old woman, and he's really worried about her. He's trying to juggle these things. He's trying to juggle his personal life, trying to be a student, trying to be a superhero, trying to be a good nephew slash son, and he can't quite get it all in order. And he's having a lot of issues. We have seen the introduction of the Green Goblin. Uh, you know. We, we know as readers, um, I, well, I, I should say, I, I need to go back and double check. I should have went back and grabbed my other issues. Uh, I, I, let me say issues. Omnibuy. I'm not, uh, I don't have all the originals. I'm not, I'm not rolling like that. Um, but th- this might actually be the first time that it was revealed that the Green Goblin was uh, Norman Osborn. I'm not sure that might have been 38. It, it, it was either that issue or this one, but we know that there's some some weirdness going on. Um, the goblin in this story is, uh, you know, he's, he's pissed because he's been kind of shown up by, um, by Spider-Man, this person, and he's just convinced that it was a fluke and he's, he's just mad about it. Uh, and he has got a plan and his plan involves unmasking Spider-Man and revealing his identity to the world. Um, you know, this is still at a time where secret identities is very, very important. Uh, you know, we're, we're only only three decades removed from Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman over at, you know, over at that, uh, that other place, you know, having the masks being very, very secretive, it being very, very necessary um, in superhero comics. So it's still a very big deal. I think we, we don't think of that as much anymore. Uh, but in this case, it was, 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like in the world that we live in, facial recognition software, we know everything like super identity, super superhero identities are kind of just at this point. Why um, for new characters? But for these old guys uh, and especially these older books, very, very important. So Pete is uh, Pete has come down with a head cold, which is really cool. Right. Like it, it is really interesting to see a superhero, a, you know, a, a world saving guy like Peter Parker, Spider-Man. The dude's battling allergies. <laughs> he's got a head cold all through this issue. He's you know, he's his he instead of, you know, a nose, he's got a nob. Like he's he, you can just tell that he's stuffed up. He needs some pseudofeds and some antihistamines. So as he's swinging through town, he he heads towards the doctor. He needs to go get a shot. He's going to get a B12 shot. Um, and the doctor's like, oh, well, we'll come in and sit down, Pete. Like wh- while you're here, we need to talk. Um, you know, I'm Aunt May's physician everything's fine. You know, her last procedure went really well, but we need to make sure that she is not surprised by anything. This, this woman needs to, you know, she needs to be pampered. Nothing needs to shock her system under no circumstances. Can any, uh, if you get a phone call with bad news, you'll wait to give it to her because it's going to do her in her heart. Can't take it. Don't let anything happen. Uh, And of course, all this is happening while one of the most devious, mysterious, um, insane, deranged villains in all of Marvel comics is coming to take this dude's mask. Uh, and so it, there's this weird setup to where, you know, you just kind of know what they're foreshadowing a giant clash, but Pete's like, okay, I can, I can do this. I can make sure I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to walk around. I'll take the bus. I'm not going to do any wall crawling. Yeah. I won't get paid because I won't get any pictures of Spidey, but it's, it's more important for me to have Aunt May around. Nothing can happen to Aunt May. So, so he does, he, he's just going to walk home and do his thing. Um, and he goes back to campus and when he gets on campus, there are these new people formerly from his high school that, that want to, I guess, befriend him for, for some reason, Betty, you know, they, they know him, he and Betty Brant's relationship went kind of awry uh, at this point. I, at this point, I don't think that we've been introduced to Gwen. I know we haven't been introduced to Mary Jane. Uh, but, you know, so the other kids on campus are wanting to talk to him, and he just kind of snubs them, just kind of walks right by. Um, they think he's being a snob. They think he's being a stick in the mud, a loner. In reality, this dude has got the weight of the world on his shoulders. Like, he's not meaning to be rude. Uh, he's not meaning to ignore them. But they don't, they don't realize that. And he can't, of course, open up to them. Well, five minutes after Pete does that, uh, then, you know, the golden boy, uh, rich kid, pseudo celebrity, uh, Harry Osborne pulls up, uh, you know, being driven by his father, Norman Osborne, getting dropped off at college. Um, And he gets out of the car and, you know, everybody's, oh, you know, wanting wanting to talk to Harry because because Harry is everybody's buddy. And he kind of does the same thing because on the ride over, um, Norman Osborne was being a dick <laughs> to his kid, was, you know, just 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 slashing out on him. And he, he doesn't understand what's going on because, you know, his dad was his best buddy. Like his dad was this guy he could go to and tell everything to. And it's uncharacteristic for Norman to treat him the way that he's been treating him for the last few weeks. He has no idea what what's going through with, you know, what's going on with his dad. Um and, and won't for a few more issues. Uh, so as, as these two people, um, Peter and, and Harry find themselves in the library, both dealing with some really heavy stuff. Um, you know, Pete just kind of says hi to Harry expecting to get smarted off to and, and fully prepared to come back with that Peter Parker snark. Um, but something happens and Harry apologizes uh, for something that happened in some previous issues. He's like, dude, I, you know, I didn't mean to, you know, I've got a lot going on. And this takes Pete back a little bit. He's like, whoa, is, is, is Harry Osborne apologizing for something? This is weird. And they end up having kind of a heart to heart there at the, the library table where they talk about how, and each of them is being very coy. They're being very, um, you know, they're, they're, they're burying the lead. They're not really saying what's going on, but uh, of course, Pete's not going to say, Hey, you know, I, I'm having a hard time because I had the sinister six try to murder me. And all of a sudden there's this flying jackass with pumpkin bombs coming at me. Um, Like he can't say that, but, but they're each kind of just opening up just a little bit to one another, which is going to lead to a very good friendship. Like that's, that's going to lead to these two bonding and becoming, you know, what we know of as best friends. And, and those seeds are planted here, which is really cool to see. Um, So after having a good day, Pete goes to walk home. Um, But, you know, while he's, he's up at the, at the university, he, somehow becomes aware of 
a stick up, a robbery that's happening on a balcony of one of the buildings. And these people are being held hostage and he can't let that stand. Right. So he's like, okay. Yeah. Okay. Aunt May's never going to find out about this. These are just some local thugs. It's just some people. It's fine. I can go deal with this. I'll get a few snapshots, swing by the daily bugle, um, get old Jay Jonas, uh, Jay Jonah Jameson in a good mood. He'll, he'll give me a check. I get some money. Okay. This is actually going to be great. So he swings into action, starts, starts going toe to toe with these guys. Um, but these guys are, they, they are just normal thugs. These are just dudes, but they have been training for Spider-Man and he doesn't like, he hears one of them talking about it as they're fighting that they like, they, they are putting up more of a fight than, than they should. They kind of know some of his moves. Um, and while they're fighting, one of the other ones kind of drops the information that they have been sent there by nor by, by the green goblin to set this up. Um, and that the green goblin is going to swoop in at any moment in time and, you know, quote unquote, save the day for these poor bastards that are getting their asses kicked by you know, Spider-Man. Um, and he doesn't show up <laughs> when he's supposed to. And they're all kind of weirded out because now they're going to lose a fight. You know, they're going to go to jail. Uh, but one of them takes out a little device and clicks it and it says gas bomb and it goes off all up in Pete's face. Just just smoke all up in his grill uh, that. But it doesn't do anything that he can think of like he's not like just kind of sloughs it off he's like i don't know what that was but that was just weird you shouldn't have done that also punch like good night um but this smoke bomb was invented by the green goblin to stifle uh down his spidey senses uh so he could track him so after he does his thing pete goes home green goblin's tracking him the whole time uh you know sees him go to the daily bugle drops off uh you sees him changing uh realizes you know sees who he is his real face um after he goes in he's eavesdropping with a little device learns that this is peter parker and inevitably falls him right up to aunt may's doorstep uh where he confronts him he's like hey bro i know who you are like like game's up you're mine yeah I, i've got you of course freaks pete out because what's the one thing that we learned at the beginning of this issue aunt may can have zero stress if, if they go toe to toe right here, Aunt May is going to look out the window and see what's going on. Drop dead of a heart attack. Not, not good, not good times. Uh, you know, so he's really, really concerned about this. So he does his best to do uh, the opposite of what Superman did in Man of Steel. <laughs> and he tries to get Norman Osborn, well, Green Goblin away. Um, in the midst of them fighting, Norman does reveal who he is. That's the very last thing. This is a giant cliffhanger. Like this is 1963. Folks didn't have the 50 years of context that we have now to know what's going on. And all of a sudden, just for the readers and for Pete, this just lands that holy shit. Like this is this is a wealthy dude and my friend's dad. Like that's doing this. Like hey, I was just talking to this dude's son in the library like two hours ago, um, and now you're trying to kill me. What the hell? Um, and it's a shock for Norman Osborn too, because this is the dude that he thinks of Spider-Man is a kid. Like he, like he, he places him. He does. I don't think he realizes this is his son's buddy, but he is taken aback by the fact that he's, that this is a kid uh, that's, that's, and it's almost insult to injury. It's salt in a wound because he expected, I guess, Captain America. Like he expected to see this hardened, you know, superhero. Mm -hmm. And it's this 19 year old child that has just beat the shit out of him, uh, an issue before. So he's not happy about it. Um, I love these stories. I love these old books. Um, you know, it really is distilled down into, um, why we love superhero stories. Now, uh, John Romita is excellent on this. You can see where he is he is following in Ditko's footsteps, but he's still giving it his own spin. Like he is not trying to be a Ditko clone, even though he's trying to keep some seamless uh, imagery and some style stylistic uh, synchronicity between those issues. And it's just, it's, it's so incredibly good. Of course, you know, these stories, Stan Lee uh, added the dialogue to it. He's being Stan and he is, it's a wordy bitch. Like, you know, the, it, it's going to take you 30 minutes to read an issue. It's not like comics today. He, he not only like he puts everything in there and just walks you through the, all of it, but the alliteration in this was, you know, was every, every, every thought bubble um, had alliteration in it uh, or he's poking fun at, at um, just everybody across the board. Uh, and, and I should say, I didn't, I don't think I read off the entirety of the, of the creative team, but um, you had Artie Simic doing the letters, you had 
like I said, it's it's Stan, it's Stan doing the quote unquote story. Um, and it's Mickey DeMeo doing the inks on it. Doesn't give you the colorist. They didn't, they didn't tell you that at the time. Um, but you know, it, it, this is early and initial Green Goblin. So like it's it's that it's that Spider-Man. Uh, it, the impetus of that Spider-Man story when it really started to get fleshed out. And for, for me, I think importantly, for somebody like me who understands, and I'll, I'll say knows, uh, but for a lot of people who, who believes that Steve Ditko was the driving force behind Spider-Man and setting the tone for Spider-Man, um, it's, it's really interesting to see a new figurehead in John Romita taking that and handing that baton off uh, for the characterization and the context of, of who Peter Parker would come to be in the next thing. It's also mind blowing for people who don't know to, to really think that Steve Ditko was on 38 issues of Spider-Man yeah. uh, because we associate him so much and we should rightfully. So we, we associate him so much, but he, you know, Spider-Man, what 1000, I, I don't know how many issues of Spider-Man, you know, but are out, but, but, you know, so many more people have touched this character than Steve Ditko has at this point, but just the astounding number of seeds that he planted um, and that he handed off to Ramita. And and I, I would believe after that, and I had to talk to people, um, friends of ours who know more than I do, who are better historians, but I would, I would, I would believe at this point that, that Stanley did take a more, a, a larger role in crafting and and pushing this because by this time spidey was the flagship character um everybody loved him he was incredibly successful um so i'm curious to see i, I would love to know personally how much creative control stanley took at that point and how much john ramita had so uh you know that, that's one of those historical things that i i don't know but i would really like to and i'm sure there's okay. been books and doctoral theses and tree i'll just you know call up Dr. Zach Crucy and ask him. He's the foremost expert about these things. Um, yeah. not, so I have to get him on the horn, but yeah, man, it was great pulling this off the shelf. Um, again, I, I pulled it off the shelf because I went and saw Spider-Man and mm. that was my, that was my first question. What yeah. led you to read this yep. one in specific? Uh, went and saw Spider-Man Thursday night, came home and grabbed this off my bookshelf. Um, cause, cause I've read the first, I've read all the Ditko stuff. I've actually not, not read the Ramita stuff. Um, all the way through, I've, I've gotten halfway through this omnibus, but I was like, you know what, let me just jump in and read this first story. Um, because there were things in the film that reminded me of this story. Some of that's there. A lot of the, it's not, it's not a spoiler because you saw this in the end of the last film, the last Spider-Man film, he's been unmasked. If you've seen, yeah. if you've seen any of the trailers for this new movie, you know, that a dr the driving plot point in this is he's been unmasked and, in the movie, everyone knows who he is. Literally everyone. He's persona non grata across the world. Um, so, so that made me want to go back and just revisit some of these beginnings for Pete. Um, I thought about grabbing issue 37, which is the issue where he, you know, basically is doing a push up the entire issue where he's got that giant machine weighing down and pushing. Him oh, really yes. Scene. I thought about grabbing that, but I've spoken about Ditko Spider-Man on the show a plethora of times, never spoken about Ramita. So I was like, this is the time uh, yeah. because so much of this movie um, is owed to John Ramita Spider-Man. Uh, uh, so much of it is owed to Ditko. So much of it is owed to Ditko, but a lot of it is owed to these issues of Ramita Spider-Man. So it, 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 it brought me a lot of joy. And again, as somebody who is a lover of comics and film, you know, if you can get your hands on these, if you watch the movie, go check these out. So um, really fun. Have you, have you read, like, I don't know if we've ever talked about that. Have you ever read any of the old, old Spidey stuff? Yeah. 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 Some, not a whole lot, but I've read some. Yeah. It's I, I uh, like I said, I've read halfway through this. I've got, the omnibus of the fantastic four as well. And I really want to read that. Yeah. Um, so I like it, you know, I haven't read all the way through that either. I think I've read like 12, the first 12 issues. Um, but I want to do my due diligence and just read all of these. Um, I need to get the Avengers omnibus and I still need to get the first Hulk omnibus. Um, yeah. But I've got those, all uh, man, those original runs are, they're, they're tough to read because I mean, they were written for young children. Yeah. So it's 
Man, it does something to your brain when you're reading those. <laughs> and they're so <laughs> verbose. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, and just from a craft aspect, it's really, it's interesting to go back to a time where, um, you know, the reason they were so verbose is because they, you know, the visual storytelling was still really being born. I mean, yeah, we, you know, Superman really kicked it off hard. Um, you know, there, we, the comics were alive before Superman, not saying that was the first by any means. Um, but, but, you know, really the narrative storytelling was still being formatted. The craft was still being invented and you had a lot of really big egos competing for, um, space on the page, so to speak. Uh, so I think that was why, that was why you saw some of you, you know, and then we think about people like Warren Ellis today who are, you know, who will let the artist just tell the story with yeah. no words. Um, it's, it's, it's strange to think about how much evolution has gone into the visual medium. Yeah. So, yeah. but I, I love it, man. I geek out about this shit. This is, this is, this is my shit. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but well, brother, uh, we about ready to wrap this thing up. Yeah, I think so. Um, I again, think so. I encourage everybody, if you can, to go see the new Spider-Man film. Um, you know, it's, I, I loved it, man. I absolutely adored it. I, I can't wait till my brothers have seen it with me, uh, because we should do an episode where we actually just talk about it. Um, I know that's, that's going to come up and I, I'm curious to see if you guys felt the same way I did. And if not, by no means is that, uh, you know, like not going to hurt my feelings if you're like, yeah, no, still not my favorite, but man, I was just, I left this thing smiling. I cried. Uh It was, it was, it was stupid. (laughs) So, um, but go see the food movie and, um, chances are that this is the last time you are going to hear our voices before Christmas. Um, I think for the most people, this is the last podcast, the pre pre Christmas podcast that's, that's going to land. So we hope you all have a fantastic holiday. Um, no matter how you spend it, if you're spending it with family, uh, if you're spending it, you know, going to go grab some Chinese food and go hit a movie theater by yourself. Awesome. Have a, have the best holiday for you. I think that's, that's fantastic. Um, so we just want to extend those, uh, those thoughts to you. Um, again, we're going to send some love out to our buddy Craig, uh, and his family as they're, they're kind of having a tough time. So with, with some illness in the family. So we, we love you immensely. We cannot say that enough. And we, our hearts are with all of you guys. Um, yeah. Reach out, read some comics, have some fun, bring some levity into your life while, while you're doing this, no matter who you are. Um, yeah. As always, we are going to wrap our show up by uh, by inviting you to read some comics that we have not read yet. <laughs> we, we don't know if they're going to be good, bad, or otherwise, but these are some stuff that we are uh, you know, probably going to grab that are on our pull list, and we think uh, you find folks would do well to check out um, – you know, at your LCS, it's, it's the end of the year. Uh, and you know, we had a really hard time picking a round table this week because there's not, you know, there's not a lot of new comics that are going to drop until after the first of the year, um, things are kind of wrapping up. So it's, it's, it's hard to, to really find new stuff to suggest that isn't already ongoing, um, and just coming out that we've already spoken about. So, uh, you know, I basically challenging you, Matt, <laughs> tell me what you oh. <laughs> tell me what you're grabbing this week. Well, I'll, uh, I'm going to fail that challenge because very predictably, I'm going to recommend people go out and get number one from Marvel Comics, King Conan. Is that finally wait, dropping? It's finally dropping. Oh, my God. <clears throat> yeah, been waiting for this book for over a year. So it's finally dropping. This is uh, going to be written by Jason Aaron and uh, the main artist on this is going to be Mahmoud as- Asrar. Yes. There's a whole other list of artists of cre- uh, on here, but I don't know what they're credited as doing. But anyway, this is Conan the Barbarian uh, set in the at the time where he has become king and he has grown restless on the throne. So he is heading west and apparently a uh, old and terrible danger threatens to end the saga of the Sumerian once and for all. I bet it don't. I bet it don't either. <laughs> um, I, 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 I really like reading old man Conan stories. I really <laughs> like old man Conan. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this a but, lot. 
what well, we were talking about this last week and there, there was a scene in one of the, the the king conan books where he's getting off a horse and just like ah oh, my sciatica yeah. <laughs> oh my back my back <laughs> oh uh yeah it's it's fun so um i forgot this was kind because this was supposed to come out this past week so i'd forgotten this was supposed to come out um yeah does this qualify as a christmas miracle well we haven't gotten it yet so. feels like feels like a christmas miracle though right right I'm, I'm gonna say it is santa's gonna deliver it right to our doorstep so uh well to just play off you uh you know no one's surprised to hear you uh, stand for a Conan book. No one should be surprised to hear me go to bat for a Wonder Woman book. That's my girl over at the Distinguished Competition. Um, love Wonder Woman. Uh, fantastic. Uh, fantastic. I got her sitting right up above my shelf. I don't know if you can see that or not. I did see that. She's she's my my she's my favorite. She's my bestie at DC, and she is being written by a really incredible creative team right now in a series called Wonder Woman Evolution. Uh, number two of eight is coming out this next week and you should go grab it. Why should you go grab it? You might ask. Well, because it's being written by my fa- one of my favorite writers right now and yours, Matt, uh, Stephanie Phillips. She's yeah. writing this and doing a fantastic job with pencils by Mike Hawthorne. Um, and if you've seen Mike Hawthorne's stuff, then you just know that dude is is awesome. So in this story, Diana finds herself in the abandoned ruins of Themyscira with no idea how she got there, but that's the least of her problems as she encounters Steve Trevor, who is determined to kill her. Wonder Woman mm. discovers that while her surroundings might not be entirely real, they can still harm her um, as her most cosmic storyline unfolds. So big fan of Steph, Stephanie Phillips. We've read multiple of her stories, talked about on the show, I think. Um, yeah. if, if we had to choose a writer who was like having her breakout year, uh, Stephanie Phillips is definitely on her, on that short list, uh, for this year, she's having a fantastic year, um, and a lot of talent and well-earned. So that's my suggestion for next week. So, nice. all right, man, well, we are going to, we're going to call that Christmas and jump off here. We hope you all have enjoyed your time with us listening to this podcast. Um, as we're recording, this a Saturday night, probably not when you're listening to it. Cause uh, I'm just going to be real honest. I ain't getting this put out for a little bit. So I'll just, I'll just mm. let folks know uh, it'll be tomorrow before this comes out, but we hope you all have a fantastic holiday again. And man, with that in mind, you know, joy to the world and all that fun shit uh, go forth and love some comics. Joy to the world and all that fun shit. (laughs) I I set you up, man. Uh, Merry Christmas, y'all.